Princess Charlotte is growing up so fast. These are new images to celebrate her birthday this weekend. Happy birthday, Princess Charlotte. This week, Charlotte turns five. Archie turns one. Now what do you want to do? <laughs> what happened? And Megan turns on the charm with an inspiring pep talk. I just wanted to be able to call in and tell you best of luck and my fingers are crossed for you, but oh, I know that thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Royal Reports, everyone. I'm your host, Sharon Carpenter. It's been another busy week for the Royal Family, so let's get right to the news. Last Tuesday, Camilla got a new gig. It was announced that while the Queen will remain the patron of the Royal Academy of Dance, her daughter-in-law will now be the organization's vice patron. The Duchess of Cornwall revealed in a video shared on Instagram that she's been enjoying the Academy's Silver Swans ballet class in an effort to stay active in her 70s. Here's a clip. I'm very, very much a beginner and probably will always remain a beginner, but I do feel after a year 80 months of doing it, that maybe I've improved a tiny bit. But oh. I'm certainly not going to be um, taken to the stage, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> I shall keep it in my own home. Way to go, Camilla. That same day, we learned that the Queen had personally called New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern to see how the Commonwealth nation was coping with the COVID-19 crisis. Prime Minister Ardern shared this photo and said of her call with Her Majesty, her affection for New Zealand, her interest in what's happening here, and her memory of places and events that are special to us never ceases to amaze me. Last Wednesday, we found out that despite the long distance, Megan is still finding ways to support her UK patronages. That day, SmartWorks, a UK-based charity that helps women find new jobs, shared a portion of a surprise video call between Megan and one of the organization's clients. Take a look. You seem incredibly confident and prepared, and exactly. I know everyone, everyone here is so excited. So when I was reading about you know, what your interests are, and especially you have a big focus in mental health as well, right? Yeah, Even you're yeah. Psychology and yeah. I think that's excellent. During the call, the Duchess offered words of encouragement to the prospective candidate as she prepared for an upcoming job interview. I think you're going to be fantastic. Oh, it's just thank so you so exciting. much. That means so much to me. Of course. <laughs> it's really, you know, there's so much going on in the world right now. Yeah. And just to, to be such a, a beacon of hope and focusing on on getting through it and all the positivity yeah. that you just want to send your way to make sure that you can get on oh. the other side of this too and have such a great opportunity there. On Saturday, Princess Charlotte Elizabeth Diana of Cambridge turned five years old. To mark the occasion, Kensington Royal shared these adorable new photos on Instagram. Of course, everyone here at the Royal Report would like to wish a belated happy birthday to the young princess. That same day, the Royal Family's YouTube channel shared a video called Kate Conducted just prior to the start of Maternal Mental Health Awareness Week in the UK. In addition to speaking with health professionals and experts, Kate also took a moment to surprise a pair of new parents. Take a look. Hello. 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 Very nice to meet you. This is definitely a, this is definitely a first, I think. <laughs> oh, well, firstly, huge congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Is it a little boy or a little girl? It's a little boy. <laughs> little boy. He's so sweet. On Monday, HarperCollins announced they'll be publishing a new book about the Sussexes. It's entitled Finding Freedom, Harry, Meghan and the Making of a Modern Royal Family, which will be released this August. According to the publisher, the biography will be written by journalist Obed Scobie and Carolyn Duran, with, quote, the participation of those closest to the couple. Well, I certainly hope there's at least one full chapter on Archie. And speaking of Archie, we have another birthday to report. That's right. Archie Harrison Mountbatten Windsor turns one today. And to celebrate, we are reliving a few of his major milestones with our brand new segment, the Royal Family Album. It's the news royal fans in Windsor and around the world have been waiting weeks for. Prince Harry and his wife Meghan have a newborn son. 
On May 6, 2019, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex welcomed their first child, Archie Harrison, Mountbatten, Windsor. Mother and baby are doing incredibly well. Um, it's been the most amazing experience <laughs> I could ever um, possibly imagine. This little thing is, is, is absolutely to die for, so I'm just over the moon. Two days later, Harry and Meghan gave eager royal watchers their first look at baby Archie, appearing for a photo call in St. George's Hall at Windsor Castle. He has the sweetest temperament. He's really calm and... Um... I don't know who gets that from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he's, been, he's just been the dream, so it's been a special couple days. That same day, the Sussexes posted Archie's first official photograph, which captured the Queen being introduced to her eighth great-grandchild. This royal meeting just happened a few moments ago. There's the Queen and Philip, oh. the little guy. Meghan's mom, Doria, is there as well. A month later, the world got another look at young Archie with this adorable Sussex royal post commemorating the newborn's first Father's Day. Little Archie there with what appears to be a finger on Harry's left hand. That July marked another major milestone for Archie, his christening, which the Sussexes celebrated with a pair of new photos, one featuring his extended family and another with mum and dad. A tender moment with their two-month-old son, the first time Archie's smiling face is in full view. In the fall, Archie embarked on his first royal tour when he accompanied his parents on a 10-day trip to Africa, which included a historic meeting with human rights activist and international icon, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And an historic moment. Meghan, who said this week, I'm here as a woman of colour, introducing their son to one of the leaders of South Africa's anti-apartheid struggle. Royal Watchers waited three more months for their next glimpse of baby Archie when his first family Christmas card was posted on the Queen's Commonwealth Trust Twitter page. Archie, front and center celebrating his very first Christmas, takes center stage while his parents, Duchess Meghan and Prince Harry, look on lovingly beneath the tree. Harry and Meghan finished off 2019 by sharing one final image of their young son on Sussex Royal. The photo capped off a short year-end video featuring family highlights along with a heartfelt message of Happy New Year. Meghan gets all the credit for snapping this sweet pic of seven-month-old Archie with Daddy Harry. The world's first look at Archie in 2020 came in early May when the Sussexes shared this video on Instagram posted by Save With Stories, a fundraising campaign to help children impacted by the COVID-19 crisis. For Save With Stories, we're going to read Duck Rabbit. Ready? The nearly three minute video filmed by Harry showed Archie enjoying one of his favorite books. It's a duck and he's about to eat a piece of bread. <laughs> Turn the page. Happy birthday, baby Archie. Yay! Good job. The end. Woo! Good job. All right, we have to take a quick break. When we return, we'll be talking to David Bryan from the legendary band Bon Jovi, who's also the composer and co-lyricist of Diana, a true musical story. You don't want to miss that. Welcome back, everyone. Our next guest accolades include a Grammy, two Tonys, and membership in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as the keyboardist of the legendary band Bon Jovi. Joining us now to talk about his latest endeavor as the composer and co-lyricist of the new Broadway show, Diana, A True Musical Story, David Bryan is with us. David, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Calling you from the uh, wonderful quarantine of New Jersey. Yeah, all quarantined right now. Yep, stay inside and, and keep people alive. That's exactly, said, right? stay safe. Now, before we dive into your work on Diana, I wanted to ask you about your experience surviving COVID-19. I know since testing positive back in mid-March, you've been sharing your recovery story on Instagram. And on April 19th, you tested negative. Great news there. So I'm curious, and I'm sure our viewers are too, what was the most important thing you learned from battling this deadly disease? Well, once I knew that I tested positive, I said, okay, I need to tell the world, because at that point, it was March 15th, somewhere around there, and it was, uh, it was, there was a lot of fear, and there was no knowledge, and everybody thought it was the plague, and it's going to kill you immediately. And I said, you know what, I, I used inspiration from actually from Diana, who was the first to go to an AIDS ward, 
and shake hands with an AIDS patient and show, you know, take away the stigma that, you know, if you touch the, if you touch somebody with HIV, you're not going to get it. So I, I felt the same thing. It's like, look, at I have it. My wife tested positive with no symptoms. I tested positive with, I was sick, but not enough to go to the hospital. And then there's people that are hospitalized and then fighting for their lives. And there's many who died. So the range of this is you know, pretty nasty. It really is. Well, we're certainly all very happy to hear that you're feeling so much better. Now, let's talk about Diana. What can you tell us about the show? What can theater goers expect once Broadway reopens, of course? Well, we had nine previews, which is pretty excellent. So we were in front of nine uh, humans, you know, nine human audiences. So that's the big thing when you get to previews is you really could see the reactions and see what's working, what's not working. And that's where you do a lot of tweaking. So I think people are going to be pleasantly surprised. I think it's going to exceed their expectations. That was the biggest feedback we got. People didn't know what to expect. And they walked in, and it's really the story of Diana. You celebrate her life and celebrate her legacy of what she did. Like just that, for, she really was so charitable. She would go to the sickest person and help them from landmines to AIDS patients to so many uh, charitable causes that she did. She really cared. Yeah, the people's princess. Now, I'm curious about the creative process here. How would you compare working with one of the greatest rock and roll bands of all time to working on a musical about three of the most famous British royals of all time? A stark contrast there. Uh, I would say stark, yes. I'm here <laughs> for that. Um, well, I've worked with Joe DiPietro and with Chris Ashley, the creative team, since uh, from Memphis. So Joe and I have been actually working, Joe DiPietro and I, since 2001, I got that script. So um, we pretty much, I, I take, I write songs. So everybody's like, oh, they sound like songs. I'm like, I know, because that's what, in rock and roll, you write a song, in the song form, if you will. Everybody, it's different than other theater. So this has a verse, a chorus, a big chorus, a sing-along chorus. So it's a, a recognizable part that you can sing over again. And then I know from my band getting in front of, anywhere from uh, a couple people to 100,000 people, you know the energy and you know how to bring it up and bring it back down and take the emotional ride. So for me, it was taking that experience and bringing it into the theater. And then I said to, to Joe, I came up with this idea. I said, why don't we, uh, what I want to do is give everybody a musical voice. So Diana would be rock and roll, pop rock of the 80s. Charles is a uh, very classical, you know, string quartet. Uh, Camilla's like light FM, like just a little acoustic guitar. Thing. <laughs> and then the queen is very snare drums and very regal. And then the paparazzi is like punk rock. And then I experimented putting, like we'll have the paparazzi moving through a song. So we have two different songs happening at the same time. So it was, uh, it sounded in theory, it was really, uh, sounded great. And in, in, in actual reality, it wasn't easy, but it was fun. Now, I'm guessing growing up in New Jersey, the British royal family was about the furthest thing from your mind, right? So what specifically about this musical made you want to be a part of it? Well, I mean, I remember the wedding. That was a big thing. I mean, Diana's my age. She would have been my age, I think maybe a half a year older. So um, I remember that wedding, and that was like the most spectacular thing in the world that you saw on TV. And we didn't have kings and queens. You know, we don't. So it was like an, this fairy tale wedding and this amazing view picture of this day. And then when Joe at Jody Pietro and I were working on another musical, he was he did some research on Diana. He said, hey, what if we do a musical on Princess Diana? I went, okay. I said, uh, write a treatment for it. So he wrote a couple page treatment. I went, wow, this is great because I found out so many things about the love triangle where Camilla was involved. And you go, wow, this is, it's actually a human story and they happen to be royals. So we told it from a human standpoint of these three people in a love triangle uh, and a very powerful mother and mother-in-law. So, you know, and when you set that against Royals, uh, I think it's this big epic story. And I think the, uh, a positive for us is that since we weren't English, we could probably not be so involved politically. You know, we had a viewpoint, I always said that, I bet you two Brits wrote Camelot, the Kennedy story. It would probably be better than Americans writing it because they wouldn't be so invested in all this extra knowledge. So how much would you say you knew about the royal family beforehand? And, and what was the most surprising thing you learned once you got started? Well, I always knew that they had really nice stuff. You know, it's always good to have a castle and, 
and coaches <laughs> and things made out of gold. And I was like, wow, that looks like that's pretty cool. Crowns and crown yeah. jewels. Yes, and, and tiaras and diamonds and billions of dollars. And you know, wow, yeah. that, that looks great. And then it's always, it goes back to the grass is always greener on the other side. You know, it's, it's almost the subtitle is trapped in the kingdom. And you look and go, wow, like Camilla helped. She was with Charles. She helped pick out Diana. Like this, it was, wow, this is unbelievable. And it's very emotional, which really helps in a musical. Like in normal life, you don't just break into song. Hopefully you don't. And, um, <laughs> but in a musical, the idea is you don't say it, you sing it. But if the motions aren't boiling up enough, it, it's just flat. So this was so emotional that there's a reason to sing. And there's like, oh, I have to burst out into this because it's so heavy. Yeah, incredible. Now, the Diana Charles Camilla Love Triangle, one of the most iconic in recent history, obviously. I have to ask, do you have a favorite of the three or perhaps a favorite to write for? No, it's really challenging to write for everybody. Uh, you know, like I have this one song for Charles, it's called The Rage. And it's like, uh, I'm a classical piano player, I studied for 20 years. And uh, it, it has like a Bach influence. You know, and then we have this other piece where, uh, it's called This Is How The People Dance, where it's rock and roll set against a Bach concerto. So I was doing this classical things and rock and roll. So it was, I can't say I have a favorite. I mean, it's all, you, you can't say which is your favorite kid. They're all my favorites. Now, of course, the characters in this show, they're all real people who just happen to be some of the most famous real people who have ever lived. How difficult was it to capture their distinct voices considering the fact that they, they are real people? Well, I mean, the good thing is that none of them really sang except probably for Happy Birthday and God Save the Queen. I don't, <laughs> and the Queen sings God Save Me, I guess. Um, <laughs> so it was kind of easy in that way where I just imagine and I just used, you know, turn on the imagination and go, okay. This is how they would sing, because they don't sing. So at least I didn't have anything to compare to. The hardest thing was the storytelling and sourcing that. And, you know, we weren't tabloidy. We didn't want to be cheesy in any way. We really wanted to stay true to this. You know, they were all, you know, there was no victims and there was no winners and losers. It just, everybody was a part of this family. And it's almost like the mob where you can't get out. And, uh, and they're all stuck in this amazing story. Well, I'm really excited because I understand that you're going to play a song for us today. Is that right? I will. Okay. I will so I think I'm ready for it. Okay. So this would be, this is going to be the last song in the show. And this is where Diana, it's called If and Like the World. So the idea is that if she would have lived, this is what her dreams would have been. Wow. Because we all know how it ends, but uh, we do it in a very classy way. So I will play it, and here we go. I offer my goodbyes without compromise. Princess moving on beyond the palace. Beyond the photographs of fairy tales, gone and gone. All I shall do again, stand and nudge you again, is to not be in blues. Mother full of pride, a princess by your side, a life finally.
David, pass me the tissues, please. <laughs> that gave me chills. I, I was really trying not to cry. That was amazing. That was incredible. Thank Absolutely you. incredible. Wow, is all I can say. And then when oh, you thank add, thank you so much. And then when you add, peak, peak. Oh, you're welcome. And then when you add 22 other people singing that, and a whole, we have a 16-piece orchestra. I call my band. And you put all that together. It is. Uh, we are a force of nature. Wow, I, I can only imagine because that right there with just you was just just mind blowing stuff. Amazing. Thank you again for joining us today, David. We really appreciate wow. it. Thank you. Can't wait for the world to go off a pause and back to play. I know. I hope Broadway opens up again soon because I can't wait to see the show. Not after that, especially. <laughs> the Royal Report will be right back, everyone. Welcome back. It's now time for our social media minutes with our social media correspondent, Jillian Fleischman. Jillian, good to see you. How's it going? Hi, Sharon. I'm great. Nice to see you again. So what do you have for us today? These might be some of my favorite royal social posts ever. Last Tuesday, in celebration of National Gardening Week in the UK, the royal family's Instagram page posted images of flowers in the Buckingham Palace Gardens. They were taken by the palace's head gardener and noted the benefits nature can have on our well-being. What a gorgeous addition to my feed. Last Wednesday, in honor of William and Kate's ninth wedding anniversary, the couple posted this flashback image from the big day on their Kensington Royal Instagram page. They also thank their followers for all the lovely messages about the special occasion. Nine years later, her dress is still stunning as ever. Last Friday, ahead of Charlotte's fifth birthday, the Kensington Royal Instagram released four new images of the princess. The images were taken by Kate and featured Charlotte assembling and delivering food packages to people in their local area. They posted an additional one on Saturday, her birthday, to say thank you for the kind wishes. What a week for the Cambridge family. And finally, this past Sunday, Princess Eugenie posted these two pictures to mark her husband Jack's birthday. The first was a picture from their wedding, and the second featured him surrounded by trees. Love that she shares so many personal photos with her followers. And that's your social media minute. All right, great stuff as always, Jillian. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sharon. The Royal Reports will be right back. Welcome back, everyone. As we mentioned earlier, this past Saturday was Charlotte's fifth birthday. So in honor of that special day, please enjoy this week's installment of Great Moments in Royal History. We're going to start here, of course, with the breaking baby news. There it is, a live shot of the Linda Wing of St. Mary's Hospital in London, where just hours ago, Princess Kate gave birth. On May 2nd, 2015, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge celebrated the birth of their second child and first daughter, Princess Charlotte Elizabeth Diana. But before the public got their first look, the happy father escorted young Prince George inside for a quick introduction. Born at 8.34 a.m. at St. Mary's Hospital, the eight pound, three ounce princess was fourth in line to the throne. And like her big brother, she also landed on the cover of People. All right, now before we go, let's check in with Max, shall we? Max, AKA the Count of Cuteness, I miss you. How are you holding up? 
Great to hear it, Max. All right, well, watchers, that's our show for today. Remember to follow people on Twitter to watch the latest episodes of The Royal Report streaming every Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. I'm Sharon Carpenter, and Max, why don't you say goodbye for the both of us? Woo!